Growing up on the same farmstead as my grandpa, his home only a few feet from mine, I spent time working the farm with him, playing and listening to his stories. Now, I was only a young kid, but I watched intently as my grandpa did his grandpa things, milking the cows, fixing the fence, throwing us a ball. I noticed he'd salute every time a flag went by and how he'd get choked up in tears before every Thanksgiving meal. Now as a kid I saw these things, but today I wonder, who is this man? They say to understand who you are, you have to know where you've come from. Where did I come from? Well, it begins on a homestead in western North Dakota with six brothers. Production funding is provided by the North Dakota Humanities Council, Williston State College Foundation, Mackenzie Electric Operation Roundup Grant, Basin Electric Power Cooperative, and the members of Prairie Public. December 20th, 1916 was a cold day, 33 degrees below zero. On that day, my grandpa Chris was born on his parents' homestead. Over the course of 20 years, six sons would be born to the parents. His parents and their neighbors of Farland Township all started from scratch. Their farm, their church, their school had all been started within the past 10 years. His mother had immigrated from Norway, and his father had moved west from where he was born to Norwegian immigrants in Horus, North Dakota. And when you look at the very early statehood development, or even, even late territorial, you had uh, people moving in, uh, different ethnic groups usually, and they tended to congregate uh, towards one area. But you'd have the speedy phenomenon of, boom, you'd have a town being built. And instantly you'd have newspapers, and then came the banks, and then schools. But part of the instant civilization is, for a lot of the ethnic groups, they were bringing in uh, items from their home country with them, and that often meant an institution that was very fundamental to their community, which was the church. Most all who settled in Farland Township came from a Lutheran religious background, and they soon gathered together for basic church services at a neighbor's homestead. They later moved the services to the schoolhouse until they were able to build a dedicated church building. Church was an integral part of the brothers' lives growing up. Services were mainly conducted in Norwegian until the 1940s. The women sat on one side and the men sat on the other side. I guess the first time my mother was in church, she sat with my dad, and then after she discovered that the rest of the ladies were sitting by themselves, then, then she started to sit by herself to, uh, with the women. The township sponsored a two-room grade school that my grandpa and his brothers attended. School kids had to be able to work on the farm, so they met for three months in the spring and three months in the early fall. It was a three-mile horseback ride for the brothers to get to school. He said the kids were out, you know, they were out during recess and they were talking Norwegian. You know, <laughs> teacher hollered out the window, speak English, boys. <laughs> As they were just beginning to get their farm and community in place, soon weather, the economy, and world events would deeply affect the family. In the first two decades of the 20th century, North Dakota's economy was dependent upon one main crop, wheat. Unfortunately for the farmers and for the rest of the state's economy, the price of wheat plummeted. One way to look at it is, a farmer could pay off a $10,000 mortgage in 1925 with only 6,700 bushels of wheat. In 1933, it would take over 33,000. Not only that, 
but the region was about to experience an extraordinary drought and a nationwide economic collapse that has since been termed the Great Depression. Going back to the Depression, how it impacted us is, you know, even that time, we took in wheat for subscriptions, we took in chickens for subscriptions, we took in eggs and milk. Uh, everybody bartered because they didn't have cash. When we had to pay our bills, we offered to do things as well. What product do we have that you want that we can give you? Uh, so <laughs> that has changed a lot. Now we're, everybody's pretty much on a cash and carry basis. When you look at out-migration statistics of North Dakota, you know, the 20s were bad, the 30s were a nightmare, and the amount of people that were starting to leave uh, was huge between 1930 and the 1940 census. You know, my Uncle Chris noted on one occasion, you know, everyone didn't really realize they were poor because everyone was kind of in the same boat, you know, they, they didn't have much. They had a lot of dry years in the 30s especially, and. This was passed on to me that my grandfather would say, if it hasn't rained by the 4th of July, then you start making plans for next year. And at harvest time, you'd say, well, hopefully we'll get our seed back. So he just kind of had a determination to, to make it work. And if you didn't get a crop, it was just a setback, but not something that you quit over. And they worked hard and not much in return, I guess, for their work. I think it taught them to be very conservative and saving because they didn't know what the next year would bring. If they'd have a crop or not next year, so they just saved what they could and got by with as little as they could and they survived. Well, just as a, I guess an example of how conservative people were, one of the neighbors washed their dishes with, or used very little soap and they washed the dishes and then they carried the dishwater out and fed the calves in the barn, making use of what might have otherwise gone to waste. I'll never forget one of the more powerful stories my dad ever told me. Uh, and it was difficult at times for him to talk about uh, being raised. You know, it might have been that Scandinavian, you know, cold front that you'd always put on. But uh, he did share one time that he had gone to Watford City with his dad, Carl. And here the uh, bank that they had had what money in, and I never did learn how much, but it was closed. And you know, it was all they had. Well, it was very easy to start a bank. All you needed was $10,000 in, in capital to start a bank in North Dakota. In 1900, there were 102 banks in the state. And then there was an agricultural boom, especially in the Western North Dakota. But in 1920, they were overextended overall. The loans outstanding were 120% of deposits, and cash on hand was only 7% of deposits. So it was pretty iffy, pretty marginal. Between 1918, the, the year that the Great War, or World War I ended, and 1933, which was the worst year ever in state and national economic history, North Dakota lost over half our banks, and that just exacerbated or worsened how the 30s were for North Dakota. The oldest three brothers only went through eighth grade, which was pretty customary for that time and place. With six growing boys in the family and income quite limited, the brothers did whatever they could to earn money off the farm including my grandpa Chris traveling over 1,000 miles west to work on a dairy farm in Washington state. The oldest brother Arnold traveled over 700 miles to southeastern Minnesota for an assignment with the Civilian Conservation Corps. The Civilian Conservation Corps was probably one of the more successful New Deal programs. I know President Roosevelt always kind of held it near and dear to his heart. It was often dubbed the, the tree army and so on. But the goal of the program was to take as many younger men and to get them out working. These camps were located right where they did the projects, usually with pick and shovel type of a work. You, know, you had a steam shovel that could indeed dig it faster, but that was not the point. 
The CCC is not a place for lazy, worthless boys, pool hall loafers, women chasers, booze hounds, or problem cases. Neither is it a place for smart Alex or wise guys. It is a place where boys of good moral character who are willing to work and who are able to take it on the chin can be made into better citizens. The CCC is a place where highly employable but inexperienced boys can improve themselves so that when they are discharged, they will be better equipped physically and mentally to go out into the world and earn an honest living. Members of the CCC, like Arnold, were paid $30 a month, 25 of which was sent back home to help provide for their family. Their work can still be seen today. And at one time, North Dakota had over 50 camps, and that's a pretty high number. I mean, much higher than a lot of the other uh, neighboring states in the area. But the idea to get people out and, and working. As the nation was reluctantly becoming more involved in what would become World War II, Grandpa's younger brother Henry was in one of the first groups of men to be drafted out of the county. They left McKinsey County in March 1941 to report for duty at Fort Snelling, Minnesota. Later that year, Grandpa Chris would be drafted too. I know Chris Stenberg was uh, very uh focused on when, he, when and where he was when he, December 7th, the attack on Pearl Harbor happened. Uh, he and a neighbor were out riding horse, uh, and they were well, kind of west-southwest of Watford City, and uh, he said that they managed to scrape up enough money that they had uh, some money to buy lunch, so they rode in to town that afternoon and went to one of the cafes, and everybody was just abuzz about uh, the news coming over the radio that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor, and you know, a great deal of concern, well, okay, where was Pearl Harbor? Some of them weren't sure about that, uh, but indeed it meant war. The American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. And uh, many speculated, you know, what does this now mean? Are we going to get called up? And within 10 days he was called up and uh, inducted into the military and then eventually went down to Fort Riley, Kansas. First basic training, and then later advanced training, and he was assigned to the United States Cavalry. As if having two sons drafted into the military the same year wouldn't be hard enough, the family encountered another huge blow that year. Selmer was Paul's best friend. Mr. Stenberg was the assessor in this community. So he'd go from place to place, you know, and, and uh, then he would bring Selmer along and Selmer would play with Paul while Mr. Stenberg was going to the neighbors for this assessment work. Yeah, he, was, he was as cute as could be. Uh, the one thing I can remember um, in church, when the Selmer would sit with his dad, and so, because my dad was, has died, so I would sneak over and sit with Selmer. Time for the collection plate, why Carl would take out his pocketbook and he'd give Selmer two pennies, give me two pennies, so we dropped them in the collection plate. <laughs> Dear Chris, many thanks for the dog collar and chain. I had the flu lately, so I've not been able to go to school. I'm about all right again now. Pete and the cats are all feeling good. Your brother, Selmer. With limited access to health facilities, medical problems were often treated in the home. It wasn't long before Selmer, who had been having recurring stomach issues, would take a serious turn for the worse. The parents finally decided to bring him to the nearest hospital, which was 35 bumpy miles away in Williston. They made it there too late. Nine-year-old Selmer's appendix burst, and the doctor wasn't able to save him. It was a tough blow for, for all of them. And, uh, and of course, for me too, because he was kind of, he was 
well, maybe not my only buddy, but because uh, I did know a couple kids in town, but he was the only one around here. Everybody, all the others were quite a bit older. Well, there's been a lot of different things running through my mind today. Some of my thoughts give me a peculiar, lonely feeling. If it wasn't for being in a crowd or a few guys all the time, I would just lay down and have me a good long cry. I'm sure you've been thinking just like me all day long about this day two years ago when dear little Selmer left us. When I sit here on my bunk, I miss him as much today as I did two years ago. He had a place in our hearts that no one else can fill. Got the Watford Guide for the first time today. Don't think I ever come so close to reading every word in a paper before as I did today when I got that paper. For a weekly newspaper, our connection has always been to the people that live here. We're not so much concerned with what's happening in Fargo or you know in any of the bigger cities. What we're concerned about is what is affecting the lives and the people here in McKinsey County. And so newspapers, especially weekly, started doing what was called a correspondence. Most people would laugh and say that is not news, but it was Uncle Bob and Aunt Jane went to Watford to go shopping and had lunch, or they had Cousin Sally over for dinner. I wrote to the several services. I wrote especially to Henry and Chris and others too from Watford. At Christmas we each had six names we should send Christmas cards to. I suppose I'd just tell about what was going on around Watford. It's queer how little it takes when a fellow is a long way from home and knows he can't go home when he wants to. Why, every letter I get, I read over twice at least. We sent uh, fig bars, and I know Henry wrote back once, and he said, thank you for the fig bars. They were so good, and they kept well, you know, even that long ways that they had to ship them. Got a box of fig bars from Burgum's yesterday. Had them with our coffee that is in our crew here, and they really tasted good. How could you go for a lunch like Mrs. Burgum used to fix about now? The weather here is about 20 above and about 2 inches of snow on the ground. Not near as cold as old North Dakota, but what I would give to change places. Seen some kids out skating a few days ago. Brings back the thoughts of the good old days. Though my grandpa Chris and his brother Henry would write their letters to home in English, his parents would write back in their native tongue, Norwegian. Kjære Christian, var i Watford fredag første gang dette år. Arnold chorte op veien på torsdag. Arnold plowed the road on Thursday with the wagons so the mailman could deliver the mail on Friday. It is going to be pretty quiet in Watford, too, now that so many people have left for the war. And you have to use stamps to buy a lot of things, like raisins and all sorts of fruit and meat. But it's good that we have all the meat we need here on the farm. Henry and Chris finished their training in the U.S. and received their orders. Henry was assigned to the European Theater, and Grandpa Chris, the South Pacific. For many years, there was some hesitancy on Chris's part to uh, talk about his World War II experience. Probably about in the late 1970s, I finally started going to him and just kind of probing him a little bit, and he started opening up. Now, in December of 1941, Douglas MacArthur had declared Manila an open city, which meant it was not going to be defended. And the countersign would be, if you're not going to bomb it, you're not going to shoot at us. So the American and Filipino forces pulled out very quickly. 
Well, the Japanese commander in the Philippines had done the same thing. He had declared Manila an open city. However, the Japanese admiral in charge of the port, uh, along with some die-hard uh, Japanese Marines and other uh, types, uh, stayed in the city. And what was anticipated to be a three-day clear-out and mopping-up operation ended up into a, a slugfest for three and a half weeks. The uh, troop that Chris was in, they had gone in with about 136 men. They were, they were short-stabbed. But after this terrible fighting, they came out with about 30 personnel. There was one place where uh, a group of student nurses uh, were forced to shield uh, an advancing Japanese infantry unit, and they had no choice but to cut them down. And, and you know, because the, the Japanese were doing anything, you know, devious like that to do. And I, I know Chris, at one time they were crossing a very famous thoroughfare in Manila, Manila called Dewey Boulevard and they had tanks that would ferry them across. And he said we had to crouch low and behind it, and you just hear the, the, the bullets pinging off that every time they went across. Even despite that terrible fire, there'd be these you know, Filipino civilians running out and pointing up. You know, if there was a sniper up on a roof or you know, on one of the upper stories or where a machine gun nest was dug in, or where perhaps they dug an anti-tank gun in to take out an American tank, you know, terrible risk, and the casualties just appalling, over 100,000 known dead. It was, it was very moving on Chris, and they were very exhausted by the time they pulled out. And he said, we lost a lot of good men after going through Manila. I remember more than one Thanksgiving hearing about the year that they were fighting on the front lines over Thanksgiving and their supply line got cut off. They didn't know if they'd live or die. And he and a buddy sharing a can of beans. And he would tell that story and then look at us today. You know, we've got all this bountiful meal here and, and we're in peace. I didn't get to send a single Christmas card this year. We were in foxholes on Christmas Eve and day and a long time before that. I sure was homesick on Christmas Eve. A fellow gets a lot of time to think over the past and future, for the nights get awfully long in the foxholes. Yes, I've seen piles of dead people again and whatnot that goes along with war. I dream about home often. Not long ago I dreamt both Henry and me were home and we were all so extremely happy. You were frying eggs, Mom. I could see you just as plain as if I were there. This army dehydrated stuff gets so tiresome that we can barely eat it. I just keep thinking and dreaming about the fresh food we had in the good old days. Henry's unit was the 776th Tank Destroyer Battalion. And initially when they landed in North Africa, they were pulling tank anti-tank guns with a uh, M3 half-track. But later on in the Italian campaign, they received what were uh, known as M10 tank destroyers. And it was a Sherman tank chassis with a open cockpit that had a, housed a 90 millimeter gun. And uh, it was the most powerful anti-tank gun in the United States arsenal at that time. And uh, Henry was a gunner. They fought up through the Italian peninsula. They were later pulled out and they were part of the Allied landings in the south of France. And they advanced up. Uh, into central France and then into the eastern border area of uh, uh, France and Germany, especially in an area uh, known as the Alsace-Lorraine. And during the Battle of the Bulge going on in December of 1944, uh, Henry's unit was attached to what was called the 62nd Infantry Division, which was kind of on the southern shoulder of the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, as they fought their own little series of actions against the German army, they started moving into a dense, concentrated, defended area that was known as the West Wall of Germany. Dear folks, I guess I could ask you any amount of questions, but it is so long between time a letter is wrote till you receive it that it is a thing of the past, almost. The last letter I got from you was April 22nd. We've had to wash and take a bath in our helmets. 
Yesterday we went down and took a good shower, which I certainly appreciated. The first shower I had in three months. Dear Brother Chris, I'm glad I haven't any steady woman, because there are a lot of guys that have been disappointed when their girls have gotten married. We'll have to wait and look the situation over when we get back. We have a lot of things to be thankful for in the past year, but have also seen a lot of things I hope and pray I'll never see again. Around 20th of April, 1945, um, Henry's unit, uh, his particular tank, as a matter of fact, was in the lead. They were riding point, as they, they call it. And they were uh, deep in Germany, and there's a small little community called Velsheim, Germany. And uh, as their tank or tank destroyer came into the town from the west, rolling on the road, uh, there was a local German uh, unit that uh, was putting up resistance and they were armed uh, with something called a Panzerfaust. And these were very cheaply designed and produced, but very deadly German anti-tank rockets. And they accounted for a great deal of Allied tanks. Well, uh, they, they got one fired and it hit uh, the tank that Henry was in, set it on fire, and the crew had to scramble to get to safety. And snipers got three out of the five crew members, uh, including uh, Private First Class Henry Stenberg. The horror of war has here come home. When one who didn't care to roam had to leave his peaceful farming toil to fight and die on foreign soil. He was beloved by everyone that knew him well, this Stenberg son, his sunny smile and quiet air, his willing hands and patience rare. He loved North Dakota its prairies and hills, its rocks and coolies and lack of frills. A peaceful man, yet he had to fight like many another for freedom's right. Memories of him will always be a blessing, like softly whispering winds caressing. Would we call him back from his quiet rest? Oh no, we wouldn't, for God knows best. So there we were, and um, we heard that Henry was killed. Um, yeah, that was a sad, sad time, I'll tell you. The pastor from Watford, his Reverend Norman, came out there, and uh, the pastor went to the barn because Carl, I suppose they probably saw him out there by the barn or something. Mrs. Melby went into the house. and. Before Mrs. Melby said anything, Mrs. Stenberg said, which one of them is it? She didn't know whether it was Chris or Henry. But, uh, so um, I'm sure that was, a, that was a tough trip for Mrs. Melby to make. I'm going to try and do one of the hardest things I've ever done. Right home after the terrible news I got about Henry. I can't believe it that he's gone. It's the same as with Selmer, they're too good to live in this sin-cursed world any longer. The boys in the troop have been very good to me. Monday after I got the news, I wasn't able to do anything, I just cried and cried. Some of the boys brought me some coffee, but I wasn't able to eat a bite and have hardly eaten since. Even the troop commander said he'd give me a couple days off, but there's no place to go. And when I stay with some of my best friends, it helps some, but I don't know how much longer I can stand this. I was planning on doing a lot of writing when we started building camp, but I don't feel like doing anything anymore. It's so hard to think about Henry after all he'd gone through, how he was always so patient, always did his best. Still, he didn't live to enjoy it. I'm sure Henry is rejoicing with Selmer and we really shouldn't grieve so much. But I just can't help it. If only I could have seen him just one more time. 
Chara Christian, skal nu for soga og skrive, nogle år til dig igen. Have lived in the hope that I would be able to live out my old days in the company of you and Henry. But Henry's death is a huge disappointment. I have surely been a poor father. Should have written more often to you both. It has not been very pleasant for the past five years. I'm exhausted and I feel like giving up at times, but have to try to keep at it a while longer. They say that after the rain comes the sunshine. It's quite hard to see a silver lining at times. Carl. In early August 1945, uh, word came down to Chris that uh, an atomic bomb had been dropped. And he, like a lot of others, you know, didn't really know what that was, but on the 6th of August, Hiroshima had gotten hit three days later, Nagasaki got hit, and Japan surrendered. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that if the atomic bombs had not forced the defeat of Japan and the actual invasion had taken place, that we would not have had Chris with us. Of the 60,000 servicemen and women from North Dakota who served in World War II, 2,000 of them died in service. Just can't believe it, but yesterday we sailed under the Golden Gate Bridge and are now in Camp Stoneman, where we were over two years ago when we were sent overseas. Tomorrow we're being shipped to Fort Lewis, Washington. How long it will take them to discharge us, why your guess would be just as good as mine. If we get delayed for some reason, I'll write again. If not, why, I will be seeing you one and all. I had always grown up thinking that patriotism and support of the military's endeavors were never questioned. As I've been digging through this process, I've come to realize that that is not necessarily true. Having lost a son in the service and having another one that, you know, day to day hearing about the fighting in the South Pacific, uh, the amount of stress that she probably went through was huge. Louise Stenberg was a uh, very uh, strong woman in some ways and, and one of those strengths was at, uh, very uh, against uh, the military. Uh, I know for many years Chris was not allowed to uh, be part of veterans groups and, or join the American Legion and so on. There's a high degree of, of pacifism, perhaps isolation might be a better term for it out of that period. Uh, you know, a lot of the Scandinavians that settled in the Northern Plains and especially the Norwegians out in this part of North Dakota, you know, not strong military. Perhaps, you know, during their Viking era, the Norwegians had gotten it out of their system, I don't know, but I know both for Carl and Louise, they came from a, a very strong, what is called Haugi Lutheran background. And the Haugi Lutherans are, you know, lover of your fellow man and so on. You know, they didn't embrace the war like some denominations did. For example, in German Lutheranism theology, there's the argument of a just war. And, you know, that's not the, anything that the Scandinavian church has necessarily embraced. I know when she passed away, Vietnam was just starting. And I know she was adamant that any grandsons of hers were not about to go into the military, at least of their own volition. You know, she, she steered people away from that pretty strongly. When I was growing up, I hardly heard anything about World War II. I just knew my dad had been in the Army, and that was about it. I think it was probably when I was in my 20s before I started hearing some details of all that he, he did go through. And maybe he just felt it wasn't appropriate for kids to hear, or um, maybe he just wasn't ready to talk about it yet either. My dad, after being a soldier in, in World War II and, and carrying weapons there, he was never interested in hunting. He never told me I couldn't hunt, but we just, we never went hunting together. But he said he didn't want to shoot anything he didn't have to. I know the last time I visited with Chris here in the Williston Hospital, uh, we were going over and he was, he was getting more candid. I mean, he was getting graphic, I guess is the best way to, to say it. And uh, the nurse came in and, and interrupted us and 
I'll never forget, he, she was going to check his vital signs. And he said, well, my blood pressure is going to be up. You know, my nephew and I have just been refighting the war. And, uh, but, but I know it brought uh, you know, some closure to him, being able to, to share those kinds of things. Uh, I just can't imagine having kept those, so many things quiet to himself for so many years. Once he arrived home, he became reacquainted with and married Gladys Olson, one of the girls who had faithfully written him letters during his time of military service. He and Grandma Gladys would settle on his parents' homestead and carry on the farming and ranching operations. Things were changing around the Farland community. Electricity was coming, and men and women began sitting together at church. Well, my mom did the housework. She did the cooking and the cleaning. And my dad did the farm work and on the tractors and the work with the cattle. The garden, too, was mainly my mom's. But of course, to get the ground ready, my dad would use a tractor and get it ready for her. And sometimes my mom helped in the barn. If um, we needed her to help milk a cow, she'd do that or, or whatever, feed the calves. I mean, she would help too, where she could, and so there were some areas that they shared their work and, and other areas that was just kind of their role. <laughs> My mom sold cream and eggs, and that usually was enough money so we could buy groceries. Grandpa's brother Cap was always known as the cowboy of the family. He worked on various ranches, including the Keough, Davidson, and Kellogg ranches. He and his wife Olga had three children. He also served as brand inspector around McKinsey County for over 20 years. Brand inspection is determining or, or, or making sure of ownership of the livestock based on uh, a hot iron brand that's on the animal that we like to call the return address. In the days before the horse trailers and the trucks, the cattle walked all the way with the guys horseback uh, guiding them along. and. Uh, Kind of an interesting time, uh, and that's when Cap was a young guy. When they went on a trail drive, they'd need somebody to feed the crew. And he did that some. They'd take a wagon and supplies, and they'd cook out along the road and sleep out on the prairie and keep everybody fed. He came to our farm quite a bit, and he was a real fix-it man. He could make things out of other people's junk, it seemed like. and. Um, make fences and gates and even a building he was fixing up and he liked to, uh, you know, you could hear him pounding away and singing at the top of his lungs and we had a dog named Bimbo and he would sing about Bimbo, Bimbo, you know, where are you going to go and on and on, you know, it was just fun to have him around and the dog loved him, of course. Mostly dad worked outside and mom worked inside and she was what I'll call old school that dad made the decisions and she just went along with them. Oh, he always got up early and liked to work with livestock or hay or fence. Um, really liked kids if there was any in the vicinity. Had to, you know, either give them treats or give them a little grief or play with them or always worked hard. I mean, I think his enjoyment was kind of work. Arnold, the oldest brother, was more of a homebody except for his six month stint with the Civilian Conservation Corps and taking a few classes at Lutheran Bible Institute in Minneapolis. My uncle Arnold lived on the same farm. He never married, but he was um, the fix-it repair man, whether it was buildings or maybe the well or a tractor, whatever. He was real good with machinery. He would do all the oil changes and keep up on that. and. Arnold always had things neat and tidy. He, um, in his little work area, everything would have its place. And, and he also liked to sing. He sang in a men's quartet in church and just really enjoyed singing. And his faith was very important to him, his Christianity. He uh, read the Bible and I remember him as our Sunday school superintendent. Arnold liked to see the buildings painted freshly, so he would say, oh, it's about time to paint that barn again. And me and my brothers, we would paint the barn and Arnold would come out there and say, oh, no, we got to use the brush the other way. Here, let me show you. And 
He would take the brush and go back and forth and back and forth, get a little bit more paint on there, okay, and then you get it down there, you gotta get all the paint out of the brush, and then when you finished painting, you were supposed to put the brush in, um, I think gasoline or something like that, get it nice and clean so that that brush was able to be used again for many years. He was very, very particular about things, Arnold was. I always remember Arnold when they thrashed when I was a little kid. He was a guy that kept the thrash machine running. I think if a berry needed to be greased in six hours, he greased it in six hours. That was Arnold, you know, he just did it. And he was good at it. I mean, he was excellent at it, but he just did it. If it was supposed to be, it was supposed to be. And that was just the way it was. I mean, he was quiet. He was more quiet, I think, than any of the rest of them. Yeah, all the, the brothers I knew, the four that I knew, were all very, very different. Uh, Arnold was very mechanical. And the others, uh, like like cattle more and horses. Grandpa's brother Ray got his start at age 20 into what would become his lifelong career, Ray's Standard Gas Station. When he was checked into his business by a uh, agent for Standard Oil, uh, they were still taking gas coupons for gas rationing. Gas was selling for 20 cents a gallon. He had three brand new tires and he had a number of hand tools for working on those tires. My folks both attended Watford City High School. She was working at a drugstore in Watford for a while and uh, later on they got uh, married on December 26, 1948. I always wondered why and so I asked them and they said well everybody would have been home for Christmas so they didn't have to send out invites and everything so I mean how more practical than that can you get? In 1959 the business faced a big challenge. While servicing vehicles, some gas fumes ignited, causing an explosion that in turn burned down the gas station. The fire did not stop him, and by the next day, Ray was operating out of an ice fishing house as he and Standard Oil rebuilt the station. My dad was very much a product of his time, a great uh, businessman and, and local boomer or supporter of the town and oftentimes that included the, the local school. North Dakota loves its sports back at that time, and I think to some extent still does. Uh, the, f the sports schedule of the local high school often dictated, you know, if it was an away game, the town shut down that night, you know, everybody had followed the team over to wherever they were playing. He also was really into sports and uh, kept up with major league teams and the local teams and did some coaching, I think, and sponsored a team that my husband played on when he was still in Watford. So sports, always big, big thing in his life. Our dad supported my brothers and I, uh, but he's very much the Scandinavian and, and the, the quintessential Norwegian edge of the glacier. You know, we better, better not show too much emotion or too much excitement. I know now that that, that wasn't the case. Uh, he had, if you will, almost sinning here, a pride, but uh, he, he did enjoy watching his sons play, uh, but uh, not where we would hear him. He's not going to come up and, and uh, you know, be pounding us, oh, great job. It was, that was a good job you did out in the field today. You know, kind of subdued. I have many memories of Ray at his gas station and the loud bell that would ding as soon as a car drove, drove in to get full service. I also remember him just enjoying people at his gas station there. He loved to talk and ask questions to people. My dad loved talking to people. And uh, the 54 years that, that he was in business, he loved talking to people. He worked up until about a week before he actually passed away. I remember visiting Ray's station with Grandpa Oftentimes, they would go across the street and have coffee at the Chuck Wagon Cafe. And sometimes I'd be able to join and hear them talk about the good old days. When I was growing up, everything was done by hand. Uh, the hay was pitched by hand and the rocks were picked by hand, fencing was by hand, so there was need of a lot of labor. And, and that's kind of changed nowadays as we have more machinery. You know, it runs into work, but it's still a lot of fun to get together with the neighbors. They bought a new machine 
my dad and Carl Stenberg in 1950, and it thrashed steady until 79 was the last year. They wanted to go for 80 to make 30 straight years, but uh, there was no crop that year. Neighbors are very important for helping with the different uh, cattle operations. In the fall when we sell cattle, neighbors come with their trailers and help us, and then we help them back. It's the most experienced help you can get, and we enjoy helping each other. We were always saving. We were always careful. We wore things till they were totally worn out, not just used, but worn out. <laughs> and, you know, we're careful not to borrow money or spend beyond our means. Um, and just expected to work hard for the money we got. Never wasting food, never wasting anything. And I, I'm still that way. I don't like to waste anything. <laughs> One activity that we would do is pick up pop cans, beer cans, along the side of the road. Uh, and I think he did it for two reasons. One was to clean up the countryside. He was proud of the area and, and the prairie, and he didn't want that to be littered on. So he would pick up cans for that reason, and then to recycle it. I think it was the first ever paycheck I got. We went up to Williston, and we had a garbage sack full, or two garbage sacks full of aluminum cans, and we got $5.81 from the, the Cash for Cans place, and my grandpa said, here, take this, you picked up more cans than I did, so this is yours. And I just thought that was, that was really cool that uh, I got that money, and it wasn't much, but it was something to show for our hard work. Grandpa always had time to help us enjoy nature. The rain was always something to celebrate. Uh, it meant that there wasn't as much work to do that day. We would look for a rainbow too. Oh look, there's a rainbow. And talking about how much rain we got, then the neighbors would call each other. Oh, did you get an inch of rain like we did or not quite? Rain was something to celebrate on the farm. I saw them kiss once. I don't know if they know that I was watching or not. I, I don't know, but the, <laughs> that's the one, one time I remember seeing them kiss. I don't know that they ever said I love you to each other in front of me. Uh, I don't remember that. There really wasn't much free time, but <laughs> if there was free time, you know, he might go to a rodeo and maybe go visit a neighbor if he had some time. Visiting neighbors was an important social event at that time. There was quite a bit of visiting back and forth. Dad did enjoy music. When we were milking cows, he'd always have the radio on, country music. We enjoyed that, and he said the cows milk better, too, if you had it on. I remember the radio, how important the radio was to Grandpa. In the barn, we always had a radio going, and, and that's where I fell in love with listening to the, to the twins on radio. Um, it seemed like we only, we never changed the station, so it was always 660 Keys Country, and, and at that time the twins were still on that station. So whenever we'd milk the cows in the evening, uh, that's what would be on the radio during the summer. Swinging a high drive deep into left field, off the wall. We always liked cheering for the underdog and against the Yankees. Well, one thing, he was always, always very nice to people, but with animals, occasionally he could have a little bit of a short temper. If a bull or a milk cow or something was misbehaving, he wouldn't be afraid to, to yell at them. I never, ever heard him yell at a person, but at an animal, at a dog, at a, a horse or a cow that was misbehaving, he might yell at them. We used to go to our grocery store and get meat scraps for our dog. One time my dad went to get that and, and this man, who was a town drunk, came and got a box as well. And My dad put it together that he was bringing that home and cooking it for himself to eat because he didn't probably have anything else to eat. And so when we were butchering chickens one day, um, my dad said, you know, I'm going to save one of these chickens and bring it in to this man. 
um, because he said, I, I bet he's eating those meat scraps. So when we were done butchering, I went with my dad and we brought this butchered chicken in um, to him. We went and it was back below the tracks where he lived in just a shack. And my dad knocked on the door and after some friendly talk and greetings, why uh, dad said, here, I've got something for you. He gave him this nice big fat butchered chicken and I'll never forget the expression on that man's face. It meant so much to him. And it was a life lesson for me to be kind to those that were in need, down and out. My grandpa, I would say, helped shape my life quite a bit. He was always very optimistic and taught us all to look at the bright side of things. Um, just thinking, I remember one time we spilled milk at the table. He's like, well, like they say, there's no use crying over spilled milk. And that phrase never made sense to me until I actually did it. <laughs> but he made a lesson out of it. When I was little, I didn't, I didn't really think much about it when Grandpa would pray in the mornings. Um, a lot of times he'd pray for me and my cousins. And um, the older that I got, the more I realized that that's really special, that Grandma and Grandpa were always praying for us every, every morning at breakfast. That was, that was important. I didn't realize at the time, but of course I was six years old when my dad passed away and, uh, and the Stenberg boys, uh, they were good to me and there was very definitely was some male bonding there. We didn't know about those things at that time, at least I certainly didn't. And I don't, but uh, you know, now you hear so much about that and, uh, and there very definitely was. And, and they were both, they were all, uh, you know, I felt real close to them. But I didn't realize it before I got to be maybe 70, 80 years old. I wish I had told both, uh, well, I guess both all of them, uh, but Chris and Cap were here the most. And uh, I don't know that I ever really told them how much I did appreciate them. My father either never, never wanted to think of himself as retired, he just said, I, I do less. But he did what he could as long as he lived. My dad did chores the day he died. Though it took some time for Grandpa to become comfortable talking about the war, especially the hard parts, there was something inside of him that wanted to get it out to us at the appropriate times. In fact, after he died, my aunt found this note that he had written and stuck into one of his army books dated April 7th, 2006. He died three days later. I think it was when Lieutenant John L. Nichols of Spur, Texas was in command of B Troop that there were five of us that were messengers of our platoon. There was a lot of confusion going on and Lieutenant Nichols was in a hurry and excited to get the troops into a perimeter when it was still daylight. So he sent messages to the platoon leaders that we had to deliver. We had to run over an open area where they were firing at us. Three of the messengers were killed was quite a shock, even though we'd been in combat quite a while. I still remember them well. All but one had been together since we were in Fort Bliss, Texas. Joe Bellotta was a replacement that I think joined us in Australia. Hugh Wallace and Enrique Vela was the other two that were killed. Vela and I were only eight to ten feet apart when he was hit in the head. I'm sure he never knew what hit him. The next morning when the sun was shining and, and they'd pulled out what was left of them, Joe Sherda, the other messenger that was okay, said to me with a faint smile, Well, Stenberg, it's just you and me left. I can see that like it was yesterday. The good Lord knows it's true what I'm writing. The officers said they lost most of the messenger boys. Thank God that I was spared and for the good life I've been permitted to live. I love all of you as much as possible. Grandpa Chris, April 7th, 2006. For three Thanksgivings, Grandpa was in the army, awash with fears of the future and for his immediate life. He had seen bad times, 
but Thanksgiving was a time to focus on the good things. <laughs> I always felt a little uncomfortable when he would tear up during his Thanksgiving prayer. But throughout my explorations, I have come to understand his life story better, one of hope, loss, and perseverance of six brothers. Production funding is provided by the North Dakota Humanities Council, Williston State College Foundation, Mackenzie Electric Operation Roundup Grant, Basin Electric Power Cooperative, and the members of Prairie Public. To order a DVD copy of Six Brothers, please call 1-800-359-6900 or visit our online store at prairiepublic.org. Thank you.